Good morning, everyone. It's a very, very special privilege for the San Diego community to host Rabbi Yisachar Fran. I'm here just for a moment to thank our co-chairs, Todd Salovey and Diane Boomer, and Adam and Marina Stragovich. And also to thank our committee, uh, Rabbi Wogelunter, the staff at Adat Yashurin, Helen Raskus back in Baltimore, and the Torah High office staff. So a very, very big thank you to all of them. And to thank our sponsors uh, for making this event possible. And really, without further ado, I'd like to call a very special person in his own right, a very special friend, Rabbi Wogelunter. Good morning. I have two introductions that I need to give very quickly. Over the past couple of uh, Shabbosos, I've been speaking about the concept and the theme of stepping outside yourself and focusing on others. We level a challenge in shul for, uh, for a week for people to, to live in that kind of way, to keep their eyes focused on what someone else needs as opposed to what, what I need. And that we spoke this past Shabbos about the amazing, the yield of that. The yield of that is really a sense, an incredible sense of simcha. As the Ramam says in the laws of Megillah and the laws of Purim, that if one has just a small amount of money, one, has, one, wants, to give, one wants to give more money for the mitzvahs of Purim, then one should focus on the mitzvah of matanos levyonim, of giving to the poor, because there is no greater simcha than helping other people, than being there for others, than focusing outside of oneself to other people. There is no greater description for Rabbi Pikes than somebody who lives his life focused on others, focused on his Talmidim, focused on ensuring that there is a viable school, and that everything he does, everything he breathes, everything he thinks about is not about himself, but really about other people. It's rare that we have the opportunity to show our Hakar Satov, to show our gratitude to Rabbi Pikes. And I think that this is um, a perfect opportunity to be able to, to, to give recognition and to be able to say thank you to Rabbi Pikes for being so selfless and for being one who focuses so much on other people. Shkaich. For those of you that have heard Rabbi Friend speak, there is also no better way for me to describe the Divrei Torah, the words of Torah, the energy, the love of Torah, the excitement, the enthusiasm, the message that comes through from Rabbi Friend's words. When Rabbi Friend prepares a, a drasha, a shir. It's not about what's the best thing to say, but it's about how is it going to be heard. The focus is not on how it's going to come out of me, but the focus is how it's going to be heard by the people that I'm speaking to. The focus is on the outside. The focus is about another person. I had the opportunity of learning from Rabbi Friend for a few years in Ner Yisrael. And the thing that perhaps made the greatest impression on me was that his focus was only on us. His focus was on the Bahram, was on us, to develop us, to make sure, are we grabbing it, are we getting it? What more can I do for them in order to make sure that they can understand the learning better and that they can, they can progress greater in their learning? When he stood up and spoke in front of 90,000 people, it wasn't about Rabbi Friend giving a great drasha. It was about touching the hearts of 90,000 people. We are so honored and so lucky to be able to have this opportunity to be able to be in the presence of Rabbi Friend to be able to see with our own eyes someone whose life is dedicated to Klal Yisrael, 
whose life is not about themselves, but whose life is about other people and their advancement in Torah and in Yiddishkeit. And it gives me great pleasure and incredible honor to be able to welcome Rabbi Friend and to have him share with us some words of Torah this morning. I don't know if the person who's in charge of the lighting is still here, but if you could make that, that it doesn't shine so directly in my eyes, I would appreciate that. My Rebbe, Rabbi Weinberg, always used to say that you have to be able to see your audience. If you can't see your audience, you can't connect. So right now, all it looks like is people's in the shadows. So. Uh, if someone could control that and just lift it up a little, I would appreciate that. In terms of what Rabbi Wolgalantra said about Rabbi Pikus, I can just say I sanction the, I, I sanction the motion and uh, I second the motion. And, um, you know, I am, I am brought throughout the year to different cities. There are always arrangements to be made. Um, Rabbi Pikus goes well beyond what is necessary to take care of a guest speaker in terms of the care and the concern and the organization and to make sure that every single one of my needs are met. And uh, as Rabbi Wogelantri said, it's just indicative of a person that uh, whose uh, sphere of influence and circle of concern goes well beyond himself and includes not only his his students but as a, a stranger and um, I, I'm very very appreciative of the care and concern that he showed to me. As far as what Rabbi Wogelanter said about me, I second that motion as well. <laughs> uh, the truth of the matter is it is it is over the top and um, and I've had a, had a very, very long relationship with Rabbi Wogelanter. I did not know him then as Rabbi Wogelanter. I knew him as Jeff. Um, it's just funny that it was at this time of the year, I think it was Erev Yom Kippur. Um, he was still a bocher, he was not married. And I remember having a discussion with him in my car in the parking lot of, in front of my house and just to see how a person has grown and uh, the concerns that, that occupy his, his life and his mind and his family now and how he has grown and what he has built, uh, any parent would be extremely proud of what he has done over the years together with his wife Shashi and uh, uh, I as not a parent but uh, you know, in, in school law, there's a concept called in loco parentis, which means in, in place of parents, a teacher is in loco parentis. And um, therefore, in that, in that context of being a, instead of parent, I, I get tremendous nachas from that which he has accomplished here uh, in, in La Jolla. If I were to hand out index cards before you walked into this auditorium and I asked you to write down what would your choice be for the most dominant news story of this past year, think a second or two for what you would write down on that card. And if I were to ask you to put down what words were used in the media over and over and over again besides Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, what would you write down for those words? Well, I did a word search of the New York Times, and over a several month period, the word Islamic State appeared 9,771 times. If you add the words ISIS or ISIL, they were used an additional 
2,769 times for a grand total of 12,540 times. If you wrote down either one of those expressions, Islamic State or ISIL, then you win the prize for this morning. In case you have been living in a cave for the last 12 months, the abbreviation ISIL stands for the Islamic State of Syria, ISIS, or ISIL, the Islamic State of the Levant. It is a movement to establish an Islamic caliphate stretching from the Middle East to North Africa and eventually into all of Europe. It is the latest manifestation of what, why, that what I am not afraid to call, even though there are some people in the administration that do not like to use this term, but what I call Islamic terrorism, plain and simple. Most Americans have been preoccupied with Islamic terrorism, terrorism since 9-11. But it predates that black day as well. People tend to forget the first bombing on the World Trade Center when they parked a truck bomb in the parking lot of, in the basement of the World Trade Center on February 18th, 1993 and tried to blow it up. So we as Americans have been dealing with Islamic terrorism for more than 20 years. We as Jews have been having to deal with which I will call for the purposes of this speech, the Bnei Yishmael, the descendants of Ishmael, and the practices, practi practitioners of his religion, his religion of Islam. We have Jews have been dealing with the Arabs and the adherence to Islam for so, so many years. It's just a matter of when you want to start counting. Do you want to start counting when Jews started returning to what was then Palestine and today Israel in the late 1880s? Do you want to start counting from 1929 when the yeshiva in Hebron, the city of Hebron, was massacred? in 1929 and they lost many students which forced them eventually to leave Hebron and to relocate in Jerusalem? Do you want to count the collaboration of Adolf Hitler and the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem in the 1920s? Or the War of Independence in 1948? Or all the subsequent wars? Or perhaps you want to start counting from the founding of the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, on June 2nd, 1964, or the first Intifada in 1987. So the question that we really should be asking ourselves is, what's happening? Something that is affecting the entire world, that is the preoccupation of, of the world, I mean, with the, the F refugee crisis that's happening in Europe as we speak, this is all a ramification of, of Islamic terrorism and the, the battles that are happening the, that are destroying countries like Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, the list goes on. So is this part of the mass, this must be part of the master plan of God. Something that preoccupies the world is not just, you know, an isolated incident. So what is this master plan? Do the sages tell, talk to us about this? Did we know about this? Is this to be found in the corpus of Jewish law and Jewish literature? Something about what's going on with the Bnei Yishmael, the sons of Ishmael and their adherents? And the answer to all of these questions is a resounding yes. We knew about this, we learned about this, they told us about this, and these predictions have come true. As far back as David Amelech, King David, who writes in Tehillim, who writes in Psalms, O Yali, woe is to me, ki garti meshech shachanti im ole kedar, Woe is to me that I must dwell 
with the people of Ohol e Kedar that the commentaries say explain to mean the descendants of Yishmael. And David HaMelech has only one reaction. Oyoli, woe is to me. Or in plain English, oy vezmir. The Malbim, one of the classic commentaries on the prophets, writes and says about these all Kedar, the Bnei Yishmoel, Shehem Anoshim Proyim, they are wild people. Oivim Umiikim, bitter enemies that cause us untold pain. The only reaction to having to live with them and put up with them is Oyoli. Vezmir. And David Amelach, King David, is not the first person to tell us about and to have this reaction of Oyoli, woe is to me. The great non Jewish prophet, whose prophecies are recorded in the Torah and Sefer by Midmar and Parshish Bolog, Bilam, who was a great prophet, he was a degenerate human being, but he was a great prophet. And he writes over there what is going to happen to the people of Israel at the end of days. Woe is to the people who have to live misumo eil. Now what do those words mean, misumo eil? They literally mean the implanted name of Eil, of God. The Pirkei Rabbi Eliezer, which was written by Rabbi Eliezer in the Talmud in the 5th century, writes and says, Omar Bilam, Bilam prophesied, Mishivim l'shayne shebar ha'kadosh baruch ba'olamai, of all the 70 nations that exist in the world, there are only two nations that have the name of God embedded in the name of the, of the nation. And that is us, Yisrael. The name Kael is embedded in our name. And the only other nation to have that, that's unique, is Yishmael. The names of God have each special connotations. The connotation of the word kale, ale, is strength, is power. God Almighty went and took two nations in the world, invested his own name, embedded his own name in their name, giving them unique and incredible power. And who are those two nations of the world? It's not Edom, and it's not all the other nations of the world. It's only two nations, Yisrael and Yishmael. Which means that we are dealing with an incredibly powerful nation. And unfortunately, they're using that power for terrible, terrible things. And that's why Bilaam's reaction is the only reaction that anyone can have. It's the same reaction that David HaMelech had and said, Oi! Mi yichye mi sumo el. Vezmir, woe is to those people that will have to put up and live in the same time as Yishmael. You know, after... We're in the Middle Ages after the Arab, Arab countries were sort of put back in their place and they were basically camel jockeys for several centuries. I wonder how people understood the, the words of the sages. We have to worry about a bunch of uh, Arabs who dwell in tents. But it's become very, very clear what Bilam had in mind. He had in mind the latter part of the 20th century and the 21st century that we're living in now. That same Tana, the Pirkei Rabbi Lezer, that sage of the Talmud, in the 5th century writes, Rabbi Yishmael Eimer, Chamisha Osa Dvarim Asidn Rabbi Bnei Yishmael Lasais Ba'aretz Ba'achris Hayomim. 
He lists 15 things that the Bnei Yishmael, the descendants of Ismael, the adherents of Islam, will do to us at the end of days. We are, by all accounts, in that period. Some of the 15 things are difficult to understand and to figure out what exactly did he mean. But some of them are, are, are eerily unfamil are familiar. For instance, V'yasu beis ha'kvaris lemir bats They'll turn a cemetery into grazing land for their cattle and turn it into a garbage dump. I don't know if any of you have been to the Har Hazesim, Mount, oh, the Mount of Olives, which is, which is where the Mashiach is going to come from. And it's a cemetery. It's been a cemetery for centuries. Well, if you go there today, you wouldn't believe it's a cemetery. You think it's a, you think it's a grazing land for goats and sheep. And you think it's like a garbage dump. And it's almost a danger to go there today. I mean, I have a former Talmud whose mother recently died old woman, they had purchased, they had purchased cemetery plots on the Har HaZesim. He went to bury his mother there. They had to go with guards. They shouldn't be attacked. They've turned it into a, a garbage dump. The sages predicted this in the fifth century. V'yar b'hasheker v'sigay sa'emes. They will, they will pervert truth. They will be a font of lies. You don't need a prophet to explain that to you. And they will erect a building on the place of the holy sanctuary. And if you've ever been in Jerusalem and you go down to the Kotel, as you come down to the Kotel, you see up above the Mokam Amigdash, the place where the Holy Temple stood. And there on that very space are two mosques. The mosque, the Dome of the Rock, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque on our property. Where the base Hamigdash stood and where the base Hamigdash will stand. And the Talmud told us this centuries, millennia ago. It's all there, it's all predicted. We are living through God's final master plan. The Rambam, the great Maimonides who lived more than 800 years ago, wrote a letter called the Geras Taimon. It was a letter to the people of Yemen who were suffering mightily under the hands of the Arabs. And the Ramam tried to mechazik them and to give them strength. And in that letter, the Rambam writes, well, Shleitamid al Yisrael Luma Yeser Yeves Mimeno, there will be no nation that will be more cruel to us than the Bnei Yishmael, the descendants of Ishmael. Well, a era of a uma she'ira, but taklis haro'a, le daldi le sanu, le hakti ni sanu, valimais ay sanu. Those words, valimais ay sanu, mean, and they will make us mius, which means they will make us despicable in the eyes of the world. And that's exactly what's happening in front of our eyes. We have become despicable. We have become the oppressors. We have become the baby killers. In an Amnesty International, after last year's war in Gaza, accused the Israeli government of war crimes of bombing civilian buildings, 
of, quote, callous indifference, end quote, to the homes of civilians. What Amnesty International conveniently does, forgets is that they were sending rockets from those civilians' homes, which is in itself a war crime. And that they were storing ammunition and rockets in hospitals and schools. And when we were bombing them, it was in self-defense. Not to speak of the 4,000 rockets that they aimed, not at military targets in Israel, but at civilians, which is also a war crime. And they've been successful. The world believes this. Valimai say sanu. They've made us the villains. We see anti-Israel demonstrations on campuses across the United States. I'm sure you've heard of the BDS movement. BDS stands for Boycott, Divest, and Sanction, a movement to get endowments of universities to divest from Israel because we're a pariah nation. BDS, boycott, divest, sanction. We, Israel. If you become a pariah nation, you can't exist in today's, in today's world. That's what happened to South Africa. And that was more than 25 years ago. If they're successful, I can't begin to think what's going to happen. Here in California, not at UCSD, but at UCLA, there was a Jewish girl that wanted to become, get a seat on the student council. She had to inter undergo an interview process. This is the question that she was asked during that interview. This is a verbatim quote. Given that you are a Jewish student and very active in the Jewish community, how do you see yourself being able to maintain an unbiased view? That question is nothing less than racist. And if you want to know the acid test of what's called racism, just substitute Jewish student with African American student. Imagine saying that. Given that you are an Afro-American student, etc., 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 you'd be bounced off of that faster than you can say Jack Robinson. That's racist. But you can say it to a Jew. But you can't say it to an African American. I read last week that there's a Jewish performer who I don't follow necessarily because I don't care for his music, named Matis Yahu. He's a reggae Jewish singer. I think more reggae than Jewish. He was supposed to perform at a Spanish music festival. And they demanded that before he'd be able to participate, he has to uh, declare his support for a Palestinian state. C can you imagine that? A music performer wants to perform, and he has to go ahead and get involved in this? There was such an outcry that they, that they rescinded the requirement, and he didn't have to do it. This is what the Rambam Maimonides meant in the 12th century when he said, They will make us meas. They will make us ugly in the eyes of the world. Yes, this has been predicted. The predictions have come, come true, unfortunately. So what do we do? How do we defeat this enormous, powerful enemy called Yishmael? And the answer to that is we must go back in history. We have to see the historical context of this epic battle 
between us and them. Avram Avinu, Abraham the patriarch, had two sons, Yishmael and Yitzchak, Yishmael and Isaac. The sages tell us that the battle between Yishmael and Isaac began when they were still children. The sages tell us that one day Yishmael saw Yitzchak alone. Roz Yitzchak Yeshev Levadai Viyara Chitz Lahargai Chitz Lahargai. Yishmael shot an arrow to try to kill Yitzchak when they were still young. That's why Sarah wanted him out of the house. And on Rosh Hashanah, when we read that Sarah tells Sarah tells Abraham, you got to get rid of this kid. And you think, how could she be so cruel? It's because her son's life was at stake. Because Yishmael has not gotten over one fact, and that is he is not the chosen heir. And Isaac is the chosen heir. And that Avram Avinu Abraham gave the land of Israel to his son Isaac and not to Yishmael. And he has never, ever gotten over that. You know, every country, every nation has its country. Yishmael was never given a country. And he's still jealous. And that's why he's trying to take over the land of Israel, because he can't get over the fact that it's not his. And that's why he covets Eretz Yisrael. And that ancient battle between Yitzhak and Yishmael, between Isaac and Ishmael, that began when they were children, continues until this very day. And it is not a battle of politics. It's not a battle only over land. It's not a military battle. It's a spiritual battle. It's a battle that's being waged down here, but, the, but it's being controlled and it's being watched by what's happening upstairs. This is a cosmic battle. It's not a battle between two countries. This is a battle that's being, been ordained by God. And for us to vanquish Ishmael, for us to win this war, we have to do one thing, become adherents to the legacy of our grandfather Isaac, and we must do it better and more passionately and more religiously and more strictly than they do it. They adhere to this legacy of their grandfather Ishmael. And we're supposed to adhere to the grand legacy of our patriarch, Isaac. Who's doing a better job? That's where the war is going to be won or lost. We must adhere to the legacy and the traditions that, pass, that we are passed down from Isaac. And what is that legacy? What is it that defines what Yitzhak with Isaac was all about? What did he excel in? What's his tradition? People love to keep to the tradition and the customs of their, of their grandparents, of their parents. We have a grandfather named Yitzhak. And what did he excel in? What defined him? Well, there are at least two things that define who Yitzhak was. One of them is tefillah. One of them is prayer. That's what Yitzhak is about. Al hatayrav, al havaydav, al hagemilas chasodim. We have three legacies. The legacy of chesed, of kindness, that we have from Abraham, the legacy of the study of Torah, which we have from Yaakov, and the legacy of prayer of Avoida that we have from Isaac. But guess what? The Bnei Yishmael also have a legacy of prayer. They also had a grandfather who excelled in prayer. They had a grandfather that was born out of the power of prayer, which you'll also read about on Rosh Hashanah. 
when Hagar, the mother of Ishmael, was banished from the house of Avraham, she was out there in the field and she prayed to God. And God answered her through an angel. You're going to have a baby. And you're going to call him Ishmael. El on Yech, because God listened to your prayers. That's how he was born. That's how he came into this world. That's how he was created, through prayer. And she had that vision of the, of the angel of God, and she called that place Be'er L'chai Ro'i. That's part of his DNA. And when we find that Yitzhak prays in the Torah, the Torah mentions to us, that Yitzhak prayed, Yitzhak Lasuach Basare, but the Torah precedes that Pasuk by telling us, and Yitzhak came from of all places, Be'er Lachai Roi. Why is it necessary to mention where he came from? The answer is, he says, he's coming from Be'er Lachai Roi because that's the place that Hagar was answered. That's the place that created Yishmael. That's their power of prayer. And therefore, I have to counteract their power of prayer. And I have to pray. And so do his descendants. We have to pray. You think davening three times a day is tough? Try praying five times a day. That's what they do. Five times a day. I don't know about the Muslim population in this city, but if you go to New York, you can see in the middle of Manhattan, all of a sudden, people are rolling out their prayer mats and stopping everything and praying and bowing towards Mecca. They pray to the same God that we do. There's just no trinity. There's no son of God. There's no partnership. There's one God who they call by the same name that we do. Yes, they have a prophet and they're making a mistake that they believe superseded the prophecy of Moshe, of Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu. It's called Mohammed. But they pray to God, the right God. The name of the Mahiril Diskin may be familiar to some of you. At the... At the Beginning of the 20th century, he was the rabbi in the land of Israel. He was once walking in Jerusalem, and he noticed an Arab rolling out his prayer mat and bowing down and praying in the middle of Jerusalem. There's a halach and shulchan aruch. It's a law, which unfortunately is observed in the breach that you are not allowed to walk in front of a person when he's in the middle of praying, middle of Shemun Ezra. Because Shechina Kenegdai. Because we believe that when you daven, when you pray, the presence of the Shechina, the presence of God, is standing right there. And you're not allowed to interrupt. The Mariel Diskin, Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin, sees this air of prayer He's walking with someone and says, we can't walk in front of him. We can't walk in front of him because he's praying to God and God is right there. Because he knew how serious they were. And he knew how devoted they were. And now I have a pointed question to ask all of us. Who takes prayer more seriously? Them or us? And I think we all know the answer to that. So number one, one of the ways that we're going to win this battle is we have to improve our prayer. Now, how do you do that? So they have been talking about improving prayer since the days 
of the Anshe Knesset Hagdaila thousands of years ago. And I'm sure your rabbis, Rabbi Pikes, Rabbi Rabbi Wolgelanter, and all the other rabbis have been talking to you about davening and having the right thoughts, etc., etc. I'm going to try a different thing this morning. I'm going to suggest that we do something physical, something actual, and that should have a, a, a marked effect on the series of davening. Now, I know this is radical. I'm only suggesting that we do this. Let's start with the next two and a half weeks. This is the week before Rosh Hashanah. We started saying Slichas. Next week is Rosh Hashanah. And the half and half week is Yom Kippur. I'm asking you to do something for two and a half weeks. Start tomorrow. Well, maybe not tomorrow, it's Labor Day. Don't come into shul with your baseball cap turned backwards. Dress like you're speaking to someone important. Now, I had an attorney tell me that he once walked into court and his top button was open and his tie was a little down. And the judge told him, if you ever walk into my courtroom again like that, I'll throw you out. Have you ever gone into a job interview? Have you ever presented a, an important deal to a person? Do you walk in with Bermuda shorts and sandals? Do you ever walk into such a meeting on a, with a t-shirt? You're dressed apart. If we believe that we're speaking to God, then dress like it. Now maybe you don't have to wear a shirt and a tie, white shirt and a tie like I do, because I sleep in my tie. <laughs> but something, a modicum of, 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 of decorum and respect And suggestion number two, and I know this is very hard. I'm only asking for two and a half weeks. Do not look at your cell phone during davening. No texting, no reading emails. Now I as I am obsessed with emails as the next guy. I am constantly checking my emails. My wife thinks I'm obsessed. She thinks other things about me as well. But, the, but I don't do it during davening. It can wait. It can wait. I know a person in business very successful he, prints, he presents multi-million dollar deals to people. He has one business associate that he knows has a policy. If we're having a meeting, and you look at your cell phone in the middle of the meeting, not in the middle of the sentence, but you know, there's a pause, and you look at your cell phone. Deals off. When you're in my office, you don't look at the cell phone. And if you do, forget it. I don't care how much money I can make on it. You know what I wonder? If God has the same policy. You look at your cell phone, deals off. You want good health, you look at your cell phone, sorry, talk to me later. All the multiple things that we ask for God, health, wealth, Children, success with our children, peace. Does he have the same policy? 
The reason I'm suggesting these two things is because these are practical, physical things that we can do. I'm not asking you to concentrate better. That's hard to do. But that's the ultimate goal. But we are of the belief that a person's activities have an influence on how he behaves. And the other thing that I think is central to what Isaac was all about is the quality that we called Mesiras Nefesh. The willing to give up his life. They willingly laid down on that altar, which we will also read about on Rosh Hashanah, and was willing to be sacrificed. That's part of what defined him, and that's part of the legacy that he gave to us the ability to give up our lives. You know, this past summer, I was on a tour as part of a tour. We went to Europe, Germany, France, Belgium, etc. We toured the cities of worms, spires, and mines. Those are real cities. There are road signs. You're approaching worms, you're approaching spires. They're known in rabbinic literature by Jew, other names, Jewish names. Shum, Vermeisen, and Magenza. Those are the cities, worms was the city in which Rashi, Rashi studied. It's, it's history to see the shul that Rashi davened in, to see the seat that Rashi studied in. Those cities, worms, spires, and mines were wiped out in the first crusade in 1096, when Pope Urban II declared that all good Christians must travel to the Holy Land and retake the city of Jerusalem from the infidel, the Muslims. But on the way there, they said, what do we have to wait to take ahead, take to kill the infidels? We'll kill the infidels right here. And they wiped out those communities. Communities that had been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. They wiped them out. If they didn't convert, they wiped them out. And simple Jews, simple Jews, quote, simple Jews, gave up their lives rather than convert to Christianity. You know, I read an account of a mother who rather had her children killed rather than baptized. I wanted to read that account to you. My wife said, do not read that account. It's too graphic. People won't be able to take it. How do people have that ability, literally, to give up their lives for the sake of their religion? You know how they have that? They have that, they have that from Isaac. We have not been asked to give up our lives for the last hundred years, at least not for religion. The Holocaust was not about converting to Christianity. But Jews have still been making sacrifices that literally cost them their, 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 at least their parnasa. You all sure know of the phenomena that happened in, the America, in this country in the early 1900s when thousands and thousands of Jews immigrated from Europe and came to the shores of this land and were given a choice on every Friday, either you come in on Saturday or you don't bother coming in on, on Monday. And you know how many Jews got fired every Friday? Because they had to keep the Shabbos? A person told me, he says, his grandfather, his grandfather had this, this test every Friday, and every single Friday, he got a pink slip. Do you know what he did with those pink slips? He collected those pink slips, pink slips. And you know what he did with them? He hung them in his sukkah. Those were his sukkah decorations. 
a wall plastered with pink slips. And to this day, this man's grandchildren, all of his children and grandchildren, are Shemar Shabbos. Because he was Meister Nefesh. Because he was willing to give up. But you know what's happened in the last 30, 40, 50 years? We haven't even had to make that decision. Because it's a five-day work week. And there are all sorts of protections and laws. Do you know what happens to a Jewish meter, a Jewish character trait, which is not used, which is not exercised? It's like a muscle that isn't exercised. It becomes atrophied. And this ability that Jews have had for millennia to give up for something greater, we've lost that. And the commentary tells us, you know what happens to a Jewish quality when we don't use it and we don't exercise it? The non-Jews take it over. In this case, you know who's taken this over? You know who's hijacked this from us? You know who's usurped this from us? Yishmael. And that's why they are willing to give up their lives for the sake of their religion. And they're willing to go ahead and strap themselves with bombs and blow themselves up and everybody else in their vicinity. Because they're Moiser Nefesh. Do you know what the word Islam means? You can look it up. You can Google it. Islam means submission to the will of God and obedience to his law. And they excel in this. They are willing to be Meister Nefesh. You know, every year the, the Muslims have what's called the Holy Month of Ramadan, so called Holy Month of Ramadan. They fast from dawn till dusk every day for a month. It came out in July. What time does sunrise here in July? 5 a.m.? And what time does it set in July here? 8, 8.30? Imagine fasting for one month for 14 hours, 15 hours. And you know what? There are no excuses. Even women have to fast. You know, I always get this question from my students. My wife is pregnant. Does she have to fast on Asar Davis? Does she have to fast on Shivasa Batamas? If it's tougher, she doesn't have to fast. My wife is pregnant. My wife is nursing. It's hard for her to fast. Does she have to fast on Asar Batavis? She wants to. No, she doesn't have to fast. Don't ask a Muslim cleric that, Shaila. Because <laughs> you'll get a no. So what am I suggesting? We kill ourselves also? We stop ourselves with bombs? God forbid. Because there's a different definition to the word nefesh. Mesiras nefesh. Because nefesh also means the word rotsen, desire, will, want. As Rashi tells us in Chumash on the Pasuk, Im Yeshes Nafshechem, says Rashi Ritzainchem. Mesiris Nefesh does not only mean giving up your life, it means giving up what you want, what you desire. And that we can all do. When we're faced with a question of what I want or what he wants, we can be Meiser Nefesh. We can give up what we want. We can, quote, practice Islam, submission to the will of God. Mesiras Nefesh in English means self-sacrifice. 
You know what self-sacrifice is? The sacrifice of self, of me. And when faced with a question of me or he, capital H, and you do what he wants rather than what you want, that's Messiris Nefesh. To give over yourself. And that is how we will win the war. We will beat them at their own game that they stole from us. We will show them that we're also willing to give up self for the, for the sake of our God. Now there's a Rebbe in the yeshiva, maybe I'm sure Rabbi Jeff knows, anyone who learned in Baltimore knows Nosan Friedman. He's a Rebbe in the high school. His father recently died. His father was a Holocaust survivor, came to this country with not knowing what to do, came to Washington, D.C. He was good with his hands, and he became an auto body mechanic, fixing auto bodies. He got a job with Capital Cadillac in the late 40s, early 50s. I have to assume, you know, those were the heyday of the Cadillac brand. I had to assume that he made a decent salary. But after a couple of years there, he said to himself, you know what, a body shop is not where an Orthodox Jew should be. The type of people that work in body shops, present company excluded, if there's anybody who's a body shop worker. And the language that they use and the things that they talk about is not an environment for a person who wants to remain an Orthodox Jew. So what did Mr. Yehuda Friedman do? He became a shamus in a shul. Now, I don't know if you're old enough to have grown up in a shul with a shamus, but it was a low-paying job. It was a job that was looked on, down on. You know, some people respected the rabbi, a few more respected the chazan. Nobody respected the shamus. The shul paid you a meager salary, and then if you had to a kaddish or a yard site and you'd come to shul, if you're in a good mood, you'd tip the shamus a couple bucks. He went from a good paying job to becoming a shamus and a shul. Because it was the right thing. It was not the easy thing, it was the hard thing. He was Meiser Nefesh. He gave over his will for the will of God. And the next time you're faced with such a situation and you ask yourself, is this the way an Orthodox Jew behaves? Is this is what God wants from me? Ask yourself, am I willing to be Meister Nefesh like they are? Is it hard? Yes, but that is precisely the point. I'm going to do it, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. If you're old enough to remember President Kennedy's speech at Rice University when he announced the program to go to the moon, Kennedy in one of his, one of his famous quotes said, we choose to do this not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Remember that quote. We choose to do this not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Men and women have different challenges. I know how difficult it is 
for women in our day and age and the challenges they face in terms of dress. And it's hard. But do it because it's hard. Not because it's easy. The tenth and final Nisoyen that Abraham faced, the ten tests, again, which we'll read about on Rosh Hashanah, what was the final test, the hardest test? It was Akedas Yitzchak. You know why it's the hardest test? Because it, it asked Abraham to do something that went against his grain that went against everything that he stood for, that went against every, every sinew in his body. Abraham, Avram, the Ish HaChesed, the man of kindness, the man who preached kindness, who acted with kindness, who represented kindness, who personified kindness, and God's asked him to do something that's not kind but cruel. That's an Esoian. That's a test. Go out of your comfort zone and do something hard. And do it not because it's easy, but because it's hard. The Rambam in his definition of what it means to sanctify God's name, the Rambam writes and he says, any person who abstains from doing a sin, or mitzvah, or performs a mitzvah, for no other reason, not out of fear, not out of fear, not because he's going to get, get some kind of award. He doesn't do it out of fear. He doesn't do it out of COVID. He doesn't do it for anything in the world. Ella! Simply because God asked me to do this. That's Kiddush Hashem. There was a Jew. His name was Joseph Friedenson, a survivor. He was a great Yiddishist. He knew the Yiddish language perfectly. Yiddish is a, it's a rich language. Most of us speak, you know, street Yiddish. But he knew the real Yiddish. He was the editor of, of a publication that was published by the Good Israel of America called Das Yiddische Wort. He was in the concentration camp. One day he was given an assignment together. He was a young man. He was a teenager. He was given an assignment with another man to clean the barracks. So they're sweeping out the barracks, and one of the people in the barracks happened to be a non-Jew. And they're sweeping under his bunk, and they notice that there's a loaf of bread. Do you know what a loaf of bread was worth in the concentration camp? So he says, let's take this bread. So the old Jew says, it's not our bread. We'll be stealing. And he says to the older Jew, stealing, this guy stole it. How do you think he got a loaf of bread? We're stealing from a, from a thief. The older man says to him, listen, I'm an old man. I ain't going to make it out of this place. I want to make a Kiddush Hashem. I want to show him that a Jew does not steal from a guy. A Jew doesn't steal. Let's give the bed, bread back. And he did. Not for honor. Not out of fear. Not out of fright. And for no other reason. 
Because that's what God wants. That's what God wants. And in the end, when it comes down to the question that it always comes down to, me or him? Choose him. And when that little voice goes off in our minds and says, but it is so hard. But it is so hard. So bear the following in mind. This is war. This is how we're going to beat them. This is how we're going to save the world from the scourge of Islamic terrorism. The world hangs in the balance. The world hangs in the balance. The state of Israel hangs in the balance. I got news for you if you haven't been paying attention. The deal with Iran is going to go through. He has the votes to override the veto. The only question is, will it get rejected by the Senate, which will necessitate a veto? Or will he get 60 votes that they can't even debate it? But it's going to happen. And Iran is going to have a nuclear bomb. A country that swears openly they want to annihilate the state of Israel. Menachem Begin once said that after the Holocaust we learned that when someone gets up and says he wants to kill the Jews, we take that seriously. It's not an idle threat. The latest Jew to fall to pressure, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the head of the Congressional Democratic Commercial Committee, came out today for the agreement. Jerry Nadler from New York City, who has the largest Jewish constituency of any congressional district in the United States, came out for the Iran deal. AIPAC has invested $20 million to try to, to, try to dissuade the Congress not to do this, and they ain't going to make it. So what's going to be? AIPAC's not going to save us. Barack Obama's not going to save us. John Kerry's not going to save us. Barbara Mikulski, the senator from Maryland who always comes to Nerio's banquets, is not going to save us. Who's going to save us? God. Because he sees that we're willing to be my and Nefesh. That we put him first and ourselves second. That's what's hanging in the balance. That's what this is about. We, this generation, has been put in this place. This is our time. This is our place. This is our challenge. We have to rise to that occasion. As difficult as it may be. Be my sir Nefesh. Give up yourself for him. That's how we'll win the war. And when Yishmo is fighting and defeated, the sages tell us, then we will see the coming of the Mashiach, the coming of the Messiah, speedily and in our days. See what Sima Taiba. I want to thank everyone again for coming, and this morning's lecture uh, was sponsored in memory of Stacey Lynn Pariser, and also for Rafua Shlema for Aaron ben Kael Lipa. Uh, but everyone, that's it. Um, please have a wonderful day, and thank you again for coming. <laughs>